Jessica Hewins flew in from DC. She is with a she is a child nutrition policy analyst with F Florida Research and Action Center, which is FRAC for us. Um, she joined FRAC in 2012, and she analyzes policy to advocate for legislative and regulatory improvements to increase low income children's access to the school nutrition programs. She works in targeted states as well as school districts to increase access to the national school lunch and school breakfast programs. Before joining FRAC, Jessica was a, fellow, was a fellow with Alliance for Healthier Generation, where she worked for school food and beverage companies to national collaboration of medical associations, insurers, and employers to offer health benefits to prevent and treat childhood obesity. She has a BA in political science and a BA in history from the University of California, and a JD from the University of Southern California, Gold School of Law. So with that, I'd like to in introduce Jessica up to the stage for so her words. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jesse Hewins and i um, really happy to be here today. Um, I'm from the Food Research and Action Center. Um, do you, can I go to the, my, oh, I do, I do, okay. <laughs> I'm from the Food Research and Action Center. Um, we are a national anti-hunger advocacy organization based out of Washington, D.C. We are um, a nonprofit and we are also nonpartisan. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of uh, what we do and, um, and talk about uh, some of the, the research that we do and talk about some Florida-specific data on hunger and um, school meal participation, and then also talk about a few trends that we've seen um, in Florida and also um, you know, across the rest of the states uh, that have increased access to uh, specifically school breakfast um, for low-income kids. Um, so a big piece of what we do is uh, conduct research and, um, and policy analysis around um, access to the school meals program. So looking at, you know, what particular states are doing, what particular school districts are doing, um, seeing what's, work, what's working, and, um, you know, trying to share that information as much as possible. Um, we also serve as a clearinghouse for uh, data and resources, and, um, and we have a ton of information on the school breakfast program and, um, and strategies to increase school breakfast participation on our website, so you can check that out. We also provide technical assistance to a number of different states and, and school districts across the country, um, and that's kind of one of my favorite parts of the job. We do some, some regranting to, uh, to school districts to do breakfast in the classroom programs and, um, and also work with uh, um, uh, groups like um, we have some folks from Florida Impact here, who's an anti-hunger group in Florida that we work pretty closely with. Um, we also lobby Congress, uh, so um, so we've got a big, uh, we've got a lot of work coming up um, on child nutrition reauthorization in the next couple of years. So that's kind of an overview of what what we do. Um, I wanted to provide just a a little bit of information about um, hunger in Florida. Uh, one of the one of the reports that we issue. Um, every couple of years is uh, around food hardship. And so this is a project that we work on with um, the Gallup organization. So they're uh, um, a polling company um, that we work with. And one of the questions that they ask is about, you know, whether families have had um, enough money to buy food, uh, you know, that their family needed in the last 12 months. And so you can see nationally, you know, this is a big problem, especially with um, households with children. It's especially, um, a big issue uh, for for families, and so uh, between 2008 and 2012, you know, we've seen a big increase in these numbers uh, due, you know, primarily to uh, economic factors. Uh, it's also um, become more of a prominent issue in Florida. You can see 28.6% um, of households with children struggled with hunger. So that's that's almost 30%, almost one in three households. So. I know that um, you're probably all familiar with, uh, you know, the issue in your schools, um, you know, children coming to school, school hungry, but you can see that it is really a, a broad issue, uh, especially in, in Florida. Um, so I just wanted to share some of that information with you. Um, this 
slide. I guess you can't see quite as well as I hoped. Um, but we, uh, we also break down the data in terms of um, metropolitan areas. So we rank um, different uh, large cities and, and surrounding areas in terms of uh, their food hardship level. And um, since Florida is such a big state, you can see that uh, seven of those areas in the top 25 are in Florida. So, um, so it's definitely something that's, um, that's widespread and that, you know, uh, that can have a huge impact here in Florida. Um, so one of the programs uh, that I work on, the school breakfast program, is obviously a very important piece of the, um, the social safety net for low-income families. Um, the school meals programs provide you know, two healthy meals for, for, uh, for low-income children every day. And unfortunately, the school breakfast program is um, pretty underutilized compared to the school lunch program. So, for a number of years at FRAC, we've been focusing on um, tracking participation in the program, figuring out um, you know, what's working in different states and different school districts in terms of increasing the number of kids that are participating. Um, we focus primarily on um, low-income students, so students that qualify for free or reduced price breakfast and lunch. Um, so the report that uh, this data is from our annual school breakfast scorecard uh, focuses specifically on participation among uh, those children. Um, so you can see, you know, a huge number of children um, in those categories participate uh, in the school breakfast program in Florida, over 600,000 on an average day. Um, and in the report, we, we take uh, the level of participation among um, low-income children, we compare it to the level of participation in the school lunch program among low-income children. So we come up with a ratio, um, and the ratio in Florida is 48.2 free and reduced price eligible students participate in breakfast for every 100 that participate in lunch. So a little under half. And um, nationally, the rate is about 52 um, to 100. So we're a little bit below the national level. Um, Definitely uh, some opportunities to expand access for more low-income kids. So excited to see you all here today, and um, and know that that's everybody's uh, that everybody's goal in this room. Um, we set uh, a goal for states. Uh, the report ranks all the 50 states and um, DC, and we've been really excited over the you know the past few years, especially to see such an increase in participation. So that ratio has gone up. Um, significantly, uh, and we've set a goal every year for um, for participation across the states. And that new goal that we set um, in the last couple of years is to have states meet um, 70 low-income children eating school breakfast for every 100 um, participating in school lunch. Um, so there's a few states that have met that goal. Um, if Florida met that goal, um, an additional 284,000 students across the state would eat school breakfast. So that kind of just puts the, the goal into perspective and, and, um, and shows just sort of the reach of the program and how, how, how much of an opportunity there is to expand um, participation. One of the things we also look at is uh, school participation in the program. Um, Florida is ranked pretty high in terms of the number of schools that are offering the school lunch program versus the school breakfast program. So um, that's a key sort of indicator of access, uh, a first level of access to the program. So um, I also wanted to share, uh, you know, that participation has been increasing. So um, all the work that everybody in this room has been doing, um, you know, is really uh, having an impact. You can see uh, in the last few years that that line has just really gone up. And, and I think that we'll see this year, um, that, that participation will keep increasing. Um, and that's due a lot to uh, a few different trends um, that we're seeing school districts implement and, and states uh, really work on. Um, I also wanted to share some of the work that we've been doing in um, Florida with some of the great partners, especially the a lot of the ones that are in the room here today. We've been working with the Dairy Council here and also um, the Florida Department of Agriculture and um, Florida Impact 
uh, we put together a website, um, floridaschoolbreakfast.org, that houses a lot of the resources that are in your folder um, um, and also on our, um, on our FRAC website, resources to engage different stakeholders. You're going to hear a lot of different um, strategies today to increase participation, and a lot of those strategies take uh, buy-in from a number of different people. So, um, you know, principals, teachers, uh, parents, students, um, all of those, all of those different uh, pieces of the puzzle are important. And so we have some resources in, in, on this website to, to help uh, communicate with those audiences. In your folder, there's also um, one of our, our issue briefs on um, the health benefits of school breakfast. We have another uh, resource also on, um, on the, the learning benefits of school breakfast as well. Um, there's also a few um, other resources on expanding participation, some uh, specific examples of success stories that we've seen uh, across the state that, um, that show, you know, switching to breakfast in the classroom or switching to um, some alternative service model has really uh, been an effective strategy for a number of school districts. We also have a, a few other reports up there. We um, work with Florida Impact on a... Um, participation report uh, um, showing participation across the school districts in Florida. So you can see how your school district ranked and see you know, what's working for, for other school districts there. And we've done that the last couple of years. Um, so before I get into a few of the trends that we've seen in terms of increasing participation, I just wanted to talk for a minute about a few of the barriers. I'm sure that you guys are all probably familiar with most of these. Um, you know, and they can all sort of combine in, in different school districts to affect participation. But just talking about the fact that the school breakfast program is underutilized, sometimes um, it's good to understand the reasons why, um, you know, kids are participating in lunch, but they don't participate in breakfast, and how some of the strategies that you guys are going to hear about today, um, and a little bit from me about, uh, you know, why they specifically address these issues. And a lot of it is, you know, timing. Uh, I think, you know, in the morning, getting your family out the door, um, you know, getting the kids to school, and then once they're at school, just sort of getting the day started is just a really busy time for, for school districts and, and um, teachers and parents. And so a lot of these barriers, uh, you know, in terms of uh, buses and, and morning schedules, um, really compound to um, decrease access for, especially for low-income families. Um, these are the strategies that I wanted to talk a little bit more about today that address some of these barriers. So um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, serving universal free breakfast. So um, a lot of school districts with high percentages of um, low-income students uh, can really increase access just by offering um, breakfast free to all kids. And I know that um, in Florida, there's been a, a lot of school districts that have taken advantage of the new community eligibility provision. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that um, and also talk a little bit about um, offering breakfast after the bell. So whether that's offering breakfast in the classroom, um, you know, delivered to the classroom and served in the classroom, or um, served from grab and go carts where kids can grab their breakfast and then go to the classroom and eat their breakfast there, or um, second chance breakfast, that works a little bit better for um, some of the older students. So I just wanted to give a quick overview of um, community eligibility and talk about um, you know, some of the success we've seen in Florida and also uh, just across the country. So this is a new opportunity for school districts to offer free breakfast and free lunch. Um, it's specifically uh, targeted for um, high poverty school districts. Uh, there's a lot of uh, really great benefits to the program. Um, it's not, the program is based not off of school meal applications as um, the lunch and breakfast program are traditionally operated uh, with. Uh, it's based off of um, the number of kids that are directly certified um, so those are uh, primarily kids that are in households participating in um, the food stamps program or the TANF cash assistance program. So um, those kids are, are directly certified, and that, that gets you your identified student percentage. And so that number of identified students is multiplied by 1.6, and then that's the number of meals that you're reimbursed for at the highest 
free rate. And then the rest of the meals you're reimbursed for at the paid rate. And so we have been working at FRAC on um, the rollout of this program over the last uh, four years. And um, it became available in Florida in this past school year. And um, we saw, saw a ton of school districts enroll. Um, and we've seen uh, you know, a big increase in participation across the states that have, uh, that have implemented the program. So, um, so I wanted to share a little bit of data from our report also. I apologize, this slide is a little bit difficult to see. Um, we've been working with, um, with uh, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, another nonprofit in DC, on um, tracking the success of the program. And we were really excited to see in a report that we released last fall that um, in the first three states that have implemented community eligibility, uh, they've seen a, a big increase in um, school breakfast participation. Across those schools, they saw a 25% increase in school breakfast participation. Um, so it's a really great opportunity for schools to, um, to increase participation, but also to streamline the program. So when you eliminate those school meal applications, uh, you know, you're eliminating a lot of administrative work, you're eliminating a lot of um, a big barrier for families. Um, we know that, that you know, just that one piece of paperwork can be a barrier for a lot of low-income families. You're also you know, eliminating uh, fees for, for other students. So students that qualify for reduced price meals are now eating for free. Um, and from the research that we've done, you know, it's clear that, that even that small co-payment can be a big barrier for low-income families. So we were really excited to see uh, the big impact that this program has been having, um, not just in Florida, but um, in the other states where it's been available. Uh, we've seen a, a big increase in the number of schools that um, opt into the program every year. So there's been, um, you know, uh, uh, an increase, uh, almost a double, um, almost a doubling of the schools that have enrolled in the program in um, the, the initial states. Uh, so it's been working really well for those schools, and more schools have been opting in. Um, in some in some states, they've combined community eligibility with um, with uh, you know doing breakfast in the classroom or or other alternative models, and that's also been a big um, a, a big uh, source of increase in, in participation in the school breakfast program. Um, I'd also note that uh, in community eligibility schools, there's been a significant increase in lunch participation, which um, nationally uh, participation has been um, has not been going up. So in community eligibility schools, uh, lunch participation has been going up by 13%. So we were really excited to see that. Um, I also wanted to talk about a few of the models that we've seen um, in Florida and in other states that have uh, really had a huge impact on increasing participation. Um, Breakfast in the Classroom is the first model that I wanted to talk about. I know that you guys will hear about this from, from other um, speakers today, so I won't, um, I won't get too much into the weeds, but um, just the way that Breakfast in the Classroom works, it really works to um, eliminate a lot of those barriers that I mentioned earlier, the timing barriers, the, um, you know, when kids don't have to get to school early to participate in school breakfast, they, um, they, uh, they just show up in class, they're, they're offered a meal. Um, it, it really uh, sort of alters the, the school environment. We've seen um, through a lot of the research we, that we've done that it's not just you know, an increase in school breakfast participation, but it's um, you know, decreases in tardies, um, lower rates of absence, uh, you know, kids are able to focus in the classroom. Um, and not go to the school nurse's office in the morning because they're hungry, um, all those kinds of things. It really changes the school environment. Um, we also uh, have seen similar uh, increases in participation through uh, grab-and-go models. So, um, you know, students grab their meals as they're coming into school, they're on their way to class, um, they can take that meal and, and, and eat it in the classroom at the start of the school day. Um, so it really also eliminates a lot of those barriers in terms of timing and, and um, the convenience of, um, you know, participating in breakfast. Uh, the last one I wanted to talk about is uh, second chance breakfast. So 
Um, there's a lot of ways that schools can implement this. They can do it um, you know, after our first period for some of the older schools, like middle schools and high schools, where, where kids are changing classes. Um, it can also be sort of a morning, um, a morning break in, in some of the lower grades. Um, so it doesn't really matter how you do it, just making it a part of the school day is the most important part so that kids don't have to get there early, they don't have to um, go out of their way to participate, and it just makes it a little bit more convenient for everyone. And this last slide is just a few uh, more resources that we have available that I wanted to highlight. Um, we have uh, a lot of different um, information about some of the reports that I talked about earlier, um, about community eligibility, about breakfast in the classroom, about all of these different models on our website. Um, and we also have a, uh, a few different uh, monthly resources that, that we put out. We have a, a school breakfast expansion network newsletter um, that we use to highlight some of our new resources and, and some of the new reports out there and, um, and some of the work that our, that our partners are doing. Um, so you, I encourage you to sign up for that. We also have a monthly uh, Breakfast Matters conference call series. So we cover a lot of different topics. Lately, we've been um, really trying to highlight uh, uh, school districts that are working on community eligibility. Um, but we're also uh, you know, talking about um, some of the work that we're doing with uh, ed different education groups uh, across the country. So um, we have a new topic every month. Um, and I encourage you all to, to sign up for those as well. And then just my contact information in case um, you ever have any questions, we're always available to, um, to help.